um, we are very pleased to have uh, our guest today, Dr. Mehdad Khansari, who was, uh, who, although on he's on holiday, <laughs> he accepted uh, to have a kind of an official meeting talking about the current situation in Iran. Uh, before I give the uh, floor to Dr. Khansari to uh, say his uh, uh, words, I would like to give a, a short, or actually a little bit long, <laughs> description, which is which is still <laughs> short regarding with his activities, uh, regarding him and introduce you to introducing him to you. Uh, Dr. Mehdad Khansari was born in uh, Tehran in uh, 1949 to a prominent family, which I just learned how prominent it is, and it is indeed with a long history of public service in the Iranian government. Influenced by his father, who was a former Iranian cabinet minister and, and ambassador, Mehdad Khonsari chose uh, to study international relations and subsequently attended Georgetown University and the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy in the United States, where he was able to complete his undergraduate and graduate degrees. Later, he completed his education with a doctorate in the field of international politics from the London School of Economics. Upon graduating from Georgetown University in 1972, uh, Dr. Khansari entered the Iranian diplomatic service where he remained until 1979. During this period, he was assigned to Iranian embassies in Washington and London <coughs> and served briefly at the Iranian permanent mission to the United Nations. Since 1980, uh, Dr. Khonsari has been a political activist for the cause of secular democracy and human rights in Iran. Having risen through the ranks for much of the 1980s and the early 1990s, Mehdar Khonsari served as a senior political ad advisor to both former and last Iranian Prime Minister during the Pahlavi period, Dr. Shapur Bakhtiar, and the former Crown Prince of Iran, Reza Pahlavi. Since 1993, Dr. Khansari has led the constitutional movement of Iran, also known as Frontline, where his position as leader has been democratically validated in the course of various biannual congresses held in Europe. In 2003, uh, Dr. Khansari, in conjunction with other prominent political figures belonging to other democratically oriented political persuasions, became a founding member of the Coalition Front for Freedom and Democracy in Iran, known also as the Freedom Front, an organization that later embraced the Iran referendum movement in uh, December 2004. In the aftermath of June 2005, presidential election in Iran based on a number of uh, universally shared principles and democratic values, Dr. Khonsari's uh, various activities have been directed towards the promotion of unity and collective action between the various democratic forces who are in opposition to the ruling theocracy. <coughs> uh, the website of his, uh, uh, of his organization, as well as the Los Angeles-based satellite television station Payame Azadi, The Message of Freedom, under the editorship of Me Mehzad Khonsari, are mediums whose only mission is to uh, is the attainment of these objectives. Dr. Khonsali is also active as an academic, as a senior research consultant to the London-based Center for Arab and Iranian Studies and a member of the Royal Institute of International Affairs, what is known as Chatham House, and the International Institute for Strategic Studies. He attends numerous international conferences and is an acknowledged writer and commentator on the Middle East. We welcome Dr. Khonsari uh, and uh, his beautiful wife, <laughs> Mandana. Yes. <laughs> uh, for uh, coming to Israel and especially coming to our center at Haifa University. And Dr. Khonsari will talk about, uh, will briefly about the situation in Iran today. Please. Thank you very much, Sully. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you this afternoon. Uh, as Sully said, we had not expected to to be talking on this subject as we are on holiday, but it's always a great pleasure to meet new people and to have the opportunity of uh, briefing them regarding uh, the situation in Iran. I thought that I would use uh, 
this little time we have to give a brief presentation of what is happening in Iran since, especially in the last several months, and then to sort of uh, let you ask questions or whatever is of particular interest to you, uh, so that I may be able to answer if I'm able to answer. Uh, I have been uh, involved in Iranian politics now for more than 30 years, which uh, shows, you know, that uh, I'm no spring chicken anymore, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, my wife and I last had the great privilege of being in Haifa 32 years ago. I came here when I was an Iranian diplomat, when we had an embassy here in this country, and relations were on a completely different footing. And uh, we visited Haifa, and we were taken around Israel, and I was uh, doing a report at the time about, uh, which had been commissioned by uh, His Majesty the late Shah of Iran, uh, on Iran-Arab relations. And the focus was how Iran-Arab relations should proceed in the future. And of course, a part and contingent of that was how the Israeli government viewed the development of Iran-Arab relations. And that's why I came here and met many people here in your foreign ministry and academic centers at the time and so on. Uh, of course, with the Iranian revolution and the removal of the previous regime, the entire uh, texture of Iran-Israeli relations changed. Iran, Iran's international uh, disposition to the international community changed. The uh, basic crux of that is because what you have in Iran or have had in Iran for the last 30 years is a revolutionary revisionist regime bent on changing the international order. They are not satisfied just with the, let's say, as Ahmadinejad crudely puts it, removing, say, Israel from the map of the world. They want to see all the Arab countries, the construction of their governments, the disposition of the states changed. That is what they, what, what they want. The way to attain it, of course, is not through military occupation or, uh, you know, you might say, wanting to invade or to pose a military threat, but to try to invigorate local domestic forces to move in this direction and to s set up and create surrogates who would do their bidding on their part. Their two most famous surrogates are, of course, Hezbollah and Hamas, which everybody knows. But nobody knows what those surrogates are called in Kuwait or, say, in UAE or in Bahrain or places like that where they have equal ambitions. But because the area of discussion is so vast, and I want to just limit it to a very brief, uh, let me say that the luster of the Iranian revolution has long vanished. What was, without question, a popular uprising popular revolution against, you might say, the despotism of one man, which was able to carry a broad coalition of political forces behind it, was very soon reduced to the dictatorship of one group over everybody else. This uh, phenomenon of one man, one vote, one time which many people use to apply to places like Algeria and so on and so forth, you know, when the Islamists were on the ascendancy, certainly applies to Iran. They came in through a popular uprising. They manipulated their popularity to entrench Khomeini's maximalist position in terms of the con what is contained in the Iranian constitution, which denies popular sovereignty to the people. It is the only modern state 
where the people have voted in a referendum to deprive themselves of the right to determine their destiny, which is unique and against any kind of, uh, you might say, logic or foresight. But Khomeini was able to achieve that through intimidation, through initial popularity, through the naiveness of the Iranian nation that was lacking in political experience and were not, basically were not politicized. But I want to say that very shortly after the Islamic Revolution of 1979, I would say not even a year, it became clear that what people had thought and what was actually taking place was different. And one by one, starting in 1979, all the allies, all the people that had become part of that grand coalition that had overthrown the Shah were one by one removed and removed from the political scene and forced to go underground. The most resilient of them was Iran's equivalent of uh, Communist Party, the Tudeh Party, who tagged along with the religious <laughs> re regime, thinking that by bending and by, by uh, sort of succumbing to everything that the regime says that they would be tolerated and they would be able to make inroads through the military and that sector to have some form of a military coup and takeover, when they were eventually caught out, and I don't know how many of you remember, uh, our young friends over there will never have, <laughs> have, uh, have would not have been born, but in 1983, uh, that's four years after the revolution, the last of the partners, which was the Tudor party, was disbanded, its leadership arrested, and it was discovered at that time that the commander of the Iranian navy had been a member of the Tudor party, and he was tried and executed. So the today the communists, had been able to make serious inroad when you have a commander of one of your main branches belonging to the Communist Party of Iran, and that's a significant achievement by any standard. So their kowtowing was not for foolishness. That they had their own agenda, but the Khomeini regime stopped it and so on. Uh, but the wedge between the people and the regime, which started in 1979, really was, it was evident to the people at the time of the outbreak of the Iran-Iraq war that this is not what they wanted. This is not what they had expected. Even people like me who belong to the old regime, when the revolution happened, I thought, well, this is going to be a a new opportunity for the nation. I didn't like it. I never supported the revolution. I believe in evolution. But I never expected the country to go in this direction. I thought there would be greater freedom, greater opportunities. These are the slogans that, that were thrown around. But under the Shah, whereas we had economic freedom, social freedom, but no political freedom, we transcended into a situation that all the other freedoms were also taken away and our country was subjected to the straitjacket of a monolithic theocratic dictatorship that is ruthless in nature and murderous in its behavior. So the wedge has increased. The Iran-Iraq war without question gave the opportunity for the regime to consolidate, to use nationalism as a force in order to entrench itself, to use that opportunity to get rid of its enemies inside Iran, to kill them under various circumstances. This Mr. Musavi, whom you have heard about, he is up to here in his neck in the blood of innocent Iranians as prime minister from 1980 to 1989 when Khomeini finally died. So he is no great hero, you know, I mean, <laughs> or he is not a role model for, for the future and so on. Although one has to say that, I will get to that later, that uh, uh, his disposition obviously uh, merited uh, some recognition in the aftermath of what happened in recent months. 
So the regime, in my view, has been an unpopular regime and detested by the majority of the Iranians starting in the 1980s, early 1980s. People like me, who Soli has known in various meetings that we've been in, conferences and so on, have been saying that for a very long time. But we were not vindicated until what happened this summer when millions of people at the first opportunity that they got were able to manifest their opposition to a system that they detest. Now, they used the opportunity of uh, questioning the validity of the election result as the first pretext to come out. But then it soon became clear that what the people wanted was not just you know, they went, the, the, the query was not the fact that Ahmadinejad should not be there and Musavi should be there, but the whole system was under question, and the whole theocracy is what people don't want. Iran, in the course of the last 30 years, has understood the most popular notion in Iran amongst all classes is secularism. It's not a question of whether they want Mr. X or Mr. Y. They want secular government. They want the clergy not to interfere in every aspect of life. And I have to say that despite the fact that in name Iran is a theocracy and the supreme leader intervenes at a theocratic level to have the final say, but the operation of Iran as a country is run on secular basis. It's a very important factor. But uh, as the Iranian regime, when they were strong at home, when they were confident that they had popular support, their behavior to the, in the outside world was subdued. They had their slogans. They had that undesirable feature about them, which didn't, you know, uh, <laughs> create any kind of, you might say, good feelings for the regime and the country, I have to say, and Islam. Because this regime has not only given Iran a bad name, it's given Islam a bad name. All this business that Islamic fundamentalism and so on and so forth that you hear, where did it start? It started right here. This is the cradle of Islamic, modern day Islamic fundamentalism. Iran is the cradle of modern day Islamic fundamentalism. Yet, Islamic fundamentalism in Iran is dead amongst the people. It has no support. It has support outside. Why? Because you have bad regimes in the Islamic world and people look to the Iranian model to overthrow, let's say, their dictators, whether they are in Egypt or in Saudi Arabia or X or Y or Z or whatever, people want to use this as an excuse. And they say, well, if this was able to overthrow the mighty Shah of Iran, then why not us overthrow, let's say, somebody like Sadat or, or uh, Mubarak or, or the Saudi king and so on and so forth. But the fact is that from a Western perspective, this Islamophobia originated with what happened in Iran and what is happening and continuing in Iran. <clears throat> As the regime became less popular at home over the passage of time, Iranian activities abroad increased and it took a nefarious nature. Involvement, let's say, beginning in 1982 in Lebanon with the creation of Hezbollah or the nourishing of these dissident Palestinian groups the hardliners, the maximalists. Why? Because the regime needed certain cards in order to play against the international community in order to safeguard their position at home. As an Iranian uh, who has been dealing with this subject, I can assure you, ladies and gentlemen, that no Iranian cares tuppence upon above the normal you know, level of wanting to sacrifice Iranian life or spend Iranian money for the Palestinian cause. But the Palestinian cause has been turned and converted into a political football 
by this regime, not because they care about the Palestinian people, because their actions have aggravated the situation for the Palestinian people, but to become a player. To become a player, for example, in this, the Arab-Israeli problem has been going on for 60 years, over 60 years. Iran was on the fringes. Iran was never a major player. Today, you cannot proceed with the Middle East peace proposal and the peace process without the direct involvement of Iran or without the side effects of what Iran does. What does Iran have to gain? Is it that they, are they doing this for the Palestinians or are they doing it for themselves? And that is the question. That is, that is the motivation across the board over a whole range of issues that the Iranian government has acted, you know, in order to try to protect itself domestically by playing outside cards. Our, some of our naive American friends think that Iran is going to be very cooperative in trying to resolve the situation in Iraq or in Afghanistan. I mean, uh, especially the president. Uh, administration, I think <laughs> they are in for a very, very hard education <laughs> in the sense Big that, surprise. yeah, because the Iranians will never, ever cooperate with America in trying to, in trying to solidify the ground, the ground for an American-inspired, American-placed government, either in Baghdad or in Kabul. I mean, that's insane. If anybody thinks that the Iranian regime is going to do that. Why? Because the Iranians do not want calm and peace and stability around themselves. They feed on instability and, uh, uh, you might say, conflict in the region. That is their raison d'etre. That's what keeps them secure and, and, and uh, immune. When the United States Many, you hear many American academics, you know, say that the United States did Iran a favor. Iran is fit because they got rid of Saddam Hussein and the Taliban. It's true. But the United States, by removing Saddam and the Taliban, did the Iranian nation a big favor. But not this regime. This regime didn't want either Saddam to go or Taliban to go. Because sandwiched between Saddam Hussein and the Taliban, they were safe. Now they're on the front line. <laughs> they don't, there is no more Saddam, there is no more Taliban. It's them. They don't want to be in this position. These are the little nuances that have to be understood. And let me just summarize and say that when it comes to their nuclear policy, something that is of huge concern to the international community, again, there is no question in my mind that they seek to become acquire nuclear weapons. Anybody who has any sense, uh, I don't think believes the kind of propaganda coming from Tehran. There is no logic in wanting to, you know, attain electricity from nuclear energy. We have the second largest gas deposits in the world of which less than 2% is utilized. I mean, where is the economic sense? Where is the environmental sense? Would a country, a sane government, subject its people to this kind of harsh treatment by the international community if its intention was just to simply have to use nuclear energy for peaceful purposes? I mean, Iranian people are silent, but they're not stupid. And you must understand that. The election this year proved that this regime it vindicated what people like myself have been saying for a number of years, that the overwhelming majority of people do not want this regime. What has happened subsequently has vindicated another point that people like myself have been saying, is that, that the command and control for leading the Iranian people must be outside Iran. Inside Iran, they are arrested, harassed, murdered. They cannot operate. Activities have to be conducted inside Iran, but the nerve center has to be in a secure place where it is out of reach of the uh, security forces of Iran, which are very efficient. The Iranian, the Iranian uh, state is run by its uh, security services. That is the most important arm. Without that, they will fall after two days.
So the fact is that these are points to consider. The threat to bomb Iran or attack Iran is what the Iranian regime wants because they they get power by mobilizing the people by propaganda using propaganda by portraying themselves as victim this resolution of the Iranian people has to come through a combination of efforts but let me end by saying that the Achilles heel of this regime is its own people it is its own people that detest this regime and it is towards the mobilization of this population that international efforts and especially efforts from people in this country who are feeling the brunt of uh, the venom of this regime more so than any any other country in the world and I want to say this that it is a, whereas it is possible for the Iranian regime to somehow mend fences with the United States which it has demonized for the past 30 years and get along with the Russians and the Chinese they will never ever normalize with this country or they will never coexist with Israel so the point is that that when it, the, the question will always remain for strategic thinkers in this country as to what we should do this is not your typical case where your knee-jerk reactions of dealing with neighboring Arabs and so on who are within reach this is a sophisticated country powerful country that can hurt this country it's not Hamas you know who throw, throw, you know five missiles these guys are, are much much more <laughs> you know powerful and you need a much much more uh, sophisticated way of thinking and approaching them and bombing them is not enough that doesn't do any good the bombing is done it's finished maybe the program is set back but they will try to try to do harm in a different way hence what I'm saying is that the thought should be given short thought should be I had I conducted a poll last year a commission paid commission you know to a company in Iran they did a public opinion poll the result was that something like 10 to 15 percent of the population is hardcore behind the regime the regime has the ability using the resources of the, of the country to mobilize another 10 15 percent so let's say maximum 30 percent you have 70% of the population who doesn't like the regime, who cannot be mobilized by the regime, who will not take money from the regime. The survival of the regime hinges on this 70% remaining immobilized. When there was a slightest opening, slightest bit of organization, as was demonstrated in the aftermath of the elections, millions of people came out. Now, for me, it's hard to believe that it is impossible to mobilize some 5% of that 70% to be the catalyst for the kind of uh, societal uh, upsurge that is required to demonstrate the uh, hostility of the people towards the regime and their demand for change. Iran deserves better. I think the region deserves better. <coughs> Iran, Iran, minus the nefarious activities of a regime like this, the Middle East would look different. You would have nobody funding Hezbollah to attack Israel. Of course, we as Shiites, as Iranians, we have a duty to support Shias in Lebanon. But it doesn't have to be by giving them bombs to throw over here. We can build hospitals for them, build schools for them, help them with their housing, with their uh, education. These are the kind of things that we did carry out under the Shah. You know, obviously it was at a much lower scale and a lot, lot more, a uh, lot lower profile. Sheikh, what's the name? Musa Saad. Musa Saad, I mean, he was receiving money from us. You know, he was receiving, we were helping him build a hospital, this, that. Now, these things can continue. We can speak up for the Palestinian cause. I'm sure there are many people in this country who are unhappy about the way that the Palestinians have been treated or the way that progress has been made. But that doesn't mean that you have to arm them and to 
move against the peace process and to try to, uh, if it hadn't been for Iranian interference, Camp David in 2000 might not have failed. Arafat, with all his, with all the things that they say, I mean, he was actually threatened by Khamenei for signing a deal. I don't know how many of you have followed that. Khamenei, in an open speech, open speech, public speech, called Arafat, he's a donkey. <laughs> he's a, you know what I mean? This is, this is, have you, have you, have you heard that? He threatened him. He was afraid. Now, Iran can be a force for good. Iran can try to help stabilize Iraq, promote democracy in Iraq. Stop playing this, what they call, prudent meddling in Afghanistan. You know, if you ask the Iranians, I mean, the, 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 the claim is, they will say, look, we're supporting uh, the central government. We helped the northern, you know, f front when 2001, after 9-11, we helped. But they don't say that they helped the other guys as well. They don't say that, <laughs> that they armed the Taliban. They don't say that, you know, eight American uh, servicemen were killed yesterday by roadside bombs. Where those roadside bombs came from? So the point is that, that one has to be clear. One has to have a strategic objective. The strategic objective is to remove this regime through the Iranian people. This is a doable prospect. Not enough attention has been paid to it. This has been a neglected fact, and it is the cheapest option. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the floor is open for uh, questions. We have about five, seven minutes. Yes, please. Uh, do you think that Obama made a mistake by not interfering and helping uh, when these uh, people went out in the streets? Yes, I think he did. I think uh, um, eventually he was forced to say something, you know. But uh, Obama, you see, the problem with Obama, in my view, vis-a-vis -vis Iran is, there are two problems that I have with Obama. Number one is whatever Bush did, he wants to do the exact opposite. Now, everything that Bush did was not wrong. Uh, and uh, when it comes to dealing with countries like Iran. I don't think I don't think what the gist of Bush's policy was wrong. Second thing is that, you know, unfortunately all of us have a tendency to uh, to become consumed by the publicity that is given to us. Obama th wants exactly the same thing as Bush wants for the United States vis-a-vis -vis Iran. He thinks that by changing the tone that the Iranians are going to give him what they didn't give to Bush. Now, Bush was aggressive, tough, whatever. Maybe he was overly tough or aggressive. But certainly, by becoming soft and lowering your voice, these guys are not going to do it. Bottom line, Obama has no leverage. Nobody has leverage over Iran as we speak. That's why they're not doing, they're not listening to anybody. You know? Israel says we might bomb. The Americans say, well, the military option is on the table. They say, go to hell. You know, <laughs> because by the time any of this has to materialize, they can always climb down at that point. They know that there is no will to attack Iran. So Obama did not want to hurt his chances of making this new opening. I personally was very disappointed. Many people that I know were disappointed. Many people were disappointed when Obama sent a New Year message, not just to the Iranian nation, but to the Iranian government. Iranian people hate the Iranian government. How can you put them on the same par? You know? But the fact is that he is, I think, getting a quick education. But he is hopeful of making some kind of a deal with these guys. And these guys, because they have lost their legitimacy at home, are looking for a deal with America. And that is, that is something that will, in the end, end up in tears, but will buy time for them, which will make it dangerous. And eventually, when Obama gets to understand the whole full picture, then unfortunately, a lot of people would have suffered. 
Yes, please. Mr. Tzemach, who just recently returned from a visit in uh, ir Iraq. From Mosul. The, the Kurdistan, okay. Iraqi Kurdistan. I would like to ask uh, about uh, Ayatollah Shariat Madari. Yeah. He was opposition of Khomeini for uh, from 1988. No, 86, no, he, he died. He died in 85. 85? 85. Okay. Because I read in the time in Arabic the Sirah Bain al Imamin, the struggle between two Imams. Which kind of struggle it was? Well, it's a major struggle. I mean, one of the things that I didn't mention, when you look at the Iranian uh, uh, religious establishment, thank you, uh, first of all, when Khomeini came to power, the West, the media, they all got it wrong. They said they presented the picture as though all the Iranian people were zealot Muslims, number one, and they were all behind Khomeini. Now, at the time when Khomeini came to power, there were six grand ayatollahs living in Iran and Iraq who were the leaders of the Shiite community in the world. Khomeini, at that time, had the largest popular following in Iran, no question, because of his opposition to the Shah. But after a year, the majority of his supporters switched to Ayatollah Khoi, who was in Iraq. Yeah. Today, Ayatollah Khoi's successor, Ayatollah Sistani, has the largest religious following in Iran. I tell you in rough terms, 90%, 90% is a hell of a large percentage, <laughs> of the religious constituency in Iran is against the Islamic government on religious grounds. Now, Ayatollah Shariat Madari was the first. Ayatollah Shariat Madari was disappointed at the Shah's conduct of policy. Later, he never validated Khomeini. He believed that the clerics should not interfere. This he was uh, more moderate? Of yes, he was. He, well, the, look, the Iranian state is run on the concept of velayat fari which means the guardianship of the clergy. When I said this regime is against popular sovereignty, it's because there's a clause in the Constitution. It's the centerpiece of the Iranian Constitution under this regime, which says that all citizens, let's say people such as yourselves who live in Israel, if you had the same Constitution, you are all considered as minors. You are not capable of understanding what is good for you politically, this right you must defer to the clergy. Now, this is what they incorporated in a constitution of a country that had had a constitutional revolution 90 years before. You know, all civilization, one of the most modern countries of the Middle East, they incorporated that which exists to this, to this day. So Khamenei today, or Khomeini, he can write any law, write anything. That's the law. He doesn't need par The parliament, we have a parliament. They can pass legislation. He says, no, stop debating this. Under President Khatami, they were trying to pass legislation about the press reform in Iran. And this guy, Karabi, was the head of the majlis. He was, he was reading it. They showed it on television. And a letter came. He opened it and he said, his eminence, the supreme leader, said that we should not discuss this anymore. That's it. <laughs> the debate closed. Shariat Madari was against this. Sistani is against this. But, uh, excuse me, Shariat Madari, uh, his uh, opposition centralized only in Azerbaijan. No. no. His support came no. from him. The, the action that took place, the action, there were certain protests and actions, that came in Azerbaijan. Shariat Madari himself was from Azerbaijan, so he had a lot of supporters in Azerbaijan, but he had supporters all over Iran. It wasn't just in Azerbaijan. Like, for example, Khomeini uh, came from around Isfahan, that central region, but, you know, or Sistani is living in, 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 
in Najaf, but he has all his people, you know, the majority of Iranians follow him. So uh, uh, it was not just limited to, 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 uh, to Azerbaijan. Yes, from an uh, uh, international uh, relationship uh, point of view, do you consider uh, Iran, uh, the current Iran, already a, a regional superpower or not yet, and why? Well, first of all, Iran has always been and will always be a regional superpower. I mean, look at our look at the size of the country, look at the population, look at our neighbors. Resources. I mean, ah, huh? resources. resources. I mean. You know, we are surrounded in the south by a host of Mickey Mouse countries, you know. <laughs> so Iran is a superpower. You don't need a nuclear bomb to be, a, you know, under the Shah, Iran, Iran's navy. In the, if there is no foreign navy in the Persian Gulf, they are, they are the ones that are in charge, you know. So uh, Iran is an old country. Iran has got 70 million people fourth or fifth largest oil reserves in the world, second largest gas reserves, lots of other min minerals, an educated middle class, a history, a background. These are what make a nation great. These ingredients are there. This regime has made the country poor. It has, it has diminished the stature of Iran, and it has diminished the prosperity of its people, and it broken it down. But so Iran is a superpower. There's, there's no question. Iran is influential. Iran can play a major role in the region. The question is whether it plays a positive role or a negative role. Today, Iran's resources and power base is being used to play a terrible game because of, of its leadership. Under the Shah, the uh, the Iranian foreign policy was a very constructive foreign policy. It, the best example is the relationship we had with Israel. The de facto recognition of the fact that Israel was here, that we had to deal with it, that we had to live with it, that we had to work with it, that we could benefit from it, and they could benefit from us. And to get to get away from this scenario of uh, that we are that we are being placed in. There was no need for Iran to try to uh, uh, to try to undermine the king in Saudi Arabia or the people in the Gulf. This regime, you know, you know, I have to tell you this. I was telling Sully, I've been to Saudi Arabia many times. I've I've met with the royal family there, the king, several times. They were they hated the Shah. Why? Because the Shah belittled them. You know, their prestige was hurt. They were, they were, Pride was ruffled. These, pe these people tried to destroy them. <laughs> you know, <laughs> the Shah, whatever he did, uh, as abrasive as he might have been, he was protecting them. The Iranian armed forces, um, I give you one example. At the height of the OPEC production in the 1970s, before the Shah fell, something like 25, 26 million barrels of oil every day went through the Strait of Hormuz. The Imperial Iranian Navy protected this flow, this sea lane of communication, free of charge, free of charge to all the Arabs. Iran fought in Oman to prevent the communist insurgency from overthrowing the Sultan. Iran helped promote security for the any all of these ruling families over there now and that 25 million that went 5 million was ours 4 million was ours the rest was theirs free of charge today they have to pay a hefty price to the Americans to the British and now the French they have to have lucrative military contracts for what? For the same thing. Now the Shah never threatened them. Okay, he, maybe in his language he could have been more diplomatic. He should have been more diplomatic. I don't, I think he was wrong. And part of my reporting, you know, was to, 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 to outline that. But this regime, and they were happy when the Shah went. 
the Saudis were ecstatic. They said, this is Islam coming to Iran. Until it started threatening them. Until Khomeini said, that you, who said you are the custodian of Mecca and Medina? Who said that? I never said that. I am the custodian. And then they started having quarrels. <laughs> you know, and it has lasted to this day. So uh, you have to look at it in, 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 those, in those perspectives. Well, I want to thank very much uh, Dr. Khansari uh, for agreeing to uh, give us uh, some of his uh, precious time and a uh, short visit to Israel. And I thank you for attending. So thank you very much. Thank you. I hope there will be other opportunities that he will come in conferences and uh, we will have more of his insights. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay.